NAS Works episode 114 isn't crazy, I'm just a little angry. Atari's split personality is on display on NES once again, as one facet of Atari conspires to break Nintendo's monopoly on its own system, the other version of Atari is publishing hit arcade games under the auspices of other publishers. In this case we have Marble Madness, a big Atari arcade hit that goes to great lengths on NES to obfuscate the fact that it has anything to do with Atari. The title screen credits the copyright to Tengen which a savvy video game history enthusiast such as yourself will of course recognize as the console publishing branch of Atari games. Kids and parents at the time? Not so much, unless they had an unusual fixation on arcade industry trade magazines. The box bears the logo of Milton Bradley, a venerable board and card game manufacturer that had dabbled in video games during the Atari 2600 era, especially on Vectrex, before largely dipping out after the big crash that had sundered Atari into two distinct companies. Depending on which source you believe, Marble Madness was either the first or second NES release for Milton Bradley, with different resources listing California games as either a December 1988 or June 1989 release. For the sake of argument, we're treating Marble Madness as their first. Meanwhile, the codebase powering this cartridge comes to us courtesy of Rare Limited. You know Rare by this point, of course, and I frankly can't imagine a more perfect exercise for the most prolific developer on NES whose name is Antose. I mean, just look at this game. For starters, it uses an isometric 3D perspective, which is absolutely Rare's bread and butter. The company had made its mark on the British computing industry under the name Ultimate Play the Game with Night Lore which featured smooth animation and non-clashing sprite graphics on the ZX Spectrum, a feat so remarkable and seemingly impossible that they even gave the programming technique behind it a name, Filmation. Apparently trademark law works differently in the UK. And of course, one of Rare's first standout titles on NES was the isometric combat racing game they had designed for Nintendo, 1988's RC Pro-Am. Squeezing great performance and elaborate 3D graphics from underpowered game systems was kind of Rare's thing. So nothing really could have made more sense in 1989 than Rare taking on Marble Madness duties for NES. And they nailed it perfectly, I'd say, bringing the arcade game's distinct look and sound to NES as faithfully as possible. Rare rightly has a reputation for top-flight music compositions, so it seems almost strange to hear them take a conservative approach to the tunes for this game. But Marble Madness had a great, memorable set of tunes in the arcade. FM synth melodies that would sound almost carnival-like, but for their slightly downbeat quality. Obviously, a rare star composer David Wise couldn't recreate the FM sound of the coin-op on NES, but he added his own spin to the tunes, incorporating some gorgeous chiptune bass that made the overall soundscape meatier and less thin. Likewise, the NES didn't quite have the resolution or color depth to perfectly recreate the arcade game's gridded technoscapes, but it does as good a job as possible recreating them. Overall, it's a bang-up port of an arcade hit. Marble Madness was the first game that Atari Games released in the wake of Atari Inc.'s breakup in the wake of the US industry crash. Like its immediate follow-up Paperboy, it demonstrated that this facet of the former gaming giant, at least, intended to go right on creating incredible video games, regardless of how Atari Corp fumbled around. Designed by a young programmer named Mark Cerny, who would go on to do a few other things of minor note, Marble Madness was a technical tour de force at the time. Its smooth motion and extremely variable isometric terrain made for a game unlike any other, a wholly abstract work that nevertheless demonstrated a subtle touch of quirky personality, which made it instantly memorable. And for fans of video game history, Marble Madness also leaned heavily into Atari's own history. Its viewpoint and control scheme immediately call to mind Crystal Castles, a minor coin-op hit for Atari Inc. that had introduced the closest thing the company has ever had to its own mascot character in Bentley Bear, while shifting the snatch -em up concept of Pac-Man into isometric 3D with far more grace than Namco's own effort years later, Pac-Mania. A big part of Crystal Castle's appeal came from its intuitive trackball-based controls, which allowed players to guide Bentley through the game's forced perspective environments with ease. 
Rather than make players deal with the diagonal orientation of the game spaces by way of, say, an 8-way joystick or even a cubert style stick locked to diagonals, Crystal Castles simply let them move freely by spinning a ball in the direction they wanted to go. Marble Madness took the same approach, allowing players to zip around its surreal stages by way of trackball. The analog nature of the input paired perfectly with the complex levels and sloped surfaces. Players could give their marble avatar greater momentum by pouring some elbow grease into their movements. Or they could nudge the marble gently around tight corners and down narrow walkways by ever so delicately urging the trackball forward. Needless to say, this feature, much like the FM sound and high-res visuals, couldn't translate directly to NES, a console with no trackball controller. Now, the Sega Master System, that had a trackball. But Marble Madness only came to Master System in Europe and South America, so you as kids were out of luck when it came to home versions of Marble Madness that controlled just like the arcade game. Much like Qbert and Gyrus, with its 8-directional controller and not the dial controller that I previously claimed, Marble Madness fans had to make do with an approximation of the coin-op experience on NES. To their credit, Rare did a pretty good job approximating the experience, given the limitations of the NES controller. I suppose you could theoretically use the NES Max or NES Advantage for a better experience than the standard D-pad offer, but even so, this isn't the worst way to interpret a trackball-based arcade game. As in the NES ports of the aforementioned Cubert and Gyrus, Marble Madness offers two control options. You can map the D-pad's directions to a diagonal, with an upward press translating to up left in the game, or you can map the D-pad to cardinal directions, forcing you to use the controller's diagonals to roll along the game's primary thoroughfares. Neither solution perfectly recreates the arcade game, but both are workable. And Marble Madness accounts for the lack of analog velocity on the digital controller. By holding A, you can give your roll a little more oomph, allowing you to zip past hazards or leap gaps. All of this is in service of a shockingly short game. Marble Madness consists of a whopping six levels, and you have anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds to complete each one. If you're a smart kid, and I know you are because you're watching NES Works, you can easily calculate the fact that a full playthrough of Marble Madness takes about three to five minutes to complete. In practice, a single session is likely to be even shorter than that. Marble Madness may offer a mere six levels of content, but it makes up for its brevity with brutality. It's a hard game, even once you get a handle on the control scheme. The spaces you need to navigate play like an updated take on the classic Marble Labyrinth toy. And steering your little ball around the cliffs and pits of the environment takes real skill. And unlike in the classic wooden Marble Labyrinth toy, Marble Madness also besets you with more active hazards than mere holes to fall through. Each stage introduces a new challenge, ranging from an aggressive enemy marble that attempts to smash and stun you, to living pools of acid that will dissolve you on sight, to vacuum tubes that attempt to pull you off track, to crows that smash your marble. Although the game might seem merciful in granting you unlimited lives, allowing you to fail as many times as you need before respawning, you'll quickly come to realize that Marble Madness does not lack fangs. The real enemy here is time, and whenever you mess up, you lose a few seconds while your death and respawn animations play out. The game doesn't exact a concrete time penalty by deducting seconds from the stage counter, but the simple delays as you reset for a new marble add up quickly in a game where you only have a minute or so to complete a stage. You can counteract this effect to some degree by mastering the early stages. Every second remaining on the counter once you roll through the goal flags of a stage carries over to the next level. There's a bonus to that stage's timer, so the better you do early on, the more leeway you have for the more difficult challenges ahead. As exacting arcade to NES ports go, Rare converted Marble Madness about as well as you could possibly imagine. It's a short, simple, challenging game that looks, sounds, and plays as much like the coin-op as anyone could reasonably expect given the platform. It does seem a little strange, here on NES in 1989, to receive yet another direct port of an arcade title. Given the mechanical variety and complexity of Marble Madness, there was a lot of room here for Rare to expand on the game by decompressing the flow of the game and spacing out the various challenges across additional levels, maybe even adding a power-up scheme or password system to track progress. But I suppose there's nothing criminal about a literal approach, provided it's handled well. I'll take a dozen solid direct adaptations like Marble Madness over a botched reinvention like Kung Fu Heroes any day. Next up, Rare and Trade West conspire to addict children to the all-American sport of football. 
using the powers of star football player John Elway. But they would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for that pesky Tecmo Bowl. Anyway, yeah, rare. At this point, I think we can officially declare Rare a significant presence on NES. Given that they handled both games this episode, and have already popped up several times so far in 1989, before we've even seen a single first-party title by Nintendo. I'm going to go ahead and say that this was not one of Rare's finer moments. If they were just going up against Ten Yard Fight, I think John Elway's quarterback would hold up reasonably well. It plays like a beefed-up version of that venerable Irem Nintendo project. In fact, just like Ten Yard Fight, the game comes to NES from the arcades. And it even operates with a similarly regimented single multiplayer structure to Ten Yard Fight. However, where Nintendo and IREM upgraded the NES port of their game to include greater play variety, Rare declined the opportunity to improve quarterback and translation. Actually, not unlike Marble Madness, the NES version here suffers from the console's inability to recreate a bespoke coin-op controller. In this case, the original quarterback evidently used a spring-loaded joystick that created a physical sensation akin to launching the ball with a catapult, a feature that obviously couldn't map across to the NES D-pad. Quarterback had been a moderate coin-op success for Trade West, their first internally developed release ever, sort of. Leland Corporation actually handled the development on Quarterback, but Leland was really just Cinematronics, you know, the Dragon's Lair people. Rebranded after being acquired by Trade West, so that Trade West could have their own studio instead of just licensing import games from SNK and Technos. The arcade success of Quarterback prompted Trade West to publish or license the game for half a dozen computers and consoles. It also resulted in Denver Broncos star quarterback and future Hall of Famer John Elway lending his name to the home conversions, and his likeness in the case of the NES box, which primarily consists of his grinning mug staring the consumer dead in the eye. I guess if you're a football fan, that's a compelling sight, though I have to imagine that for a normal human, it simply triggers a fight or flight response. Either category of person will have the same reaction to the game itself, namely, oh. This is a perfectly lukewarm take on football. It's not particularly good or interesting, mind you. It doesn't even look that much better than Ten Yard Fight, with weirdly robotic players who glide stiffly across the field and don't even appear in sufficient numbers to qualify as a proper football team. The audio seems okay-ish, and it does functionally represent the sport of football as most people would recognize it. But there's no spark of life here, no element of style or grace that would motivate someone to grab this instead of a competing title, unless they just couldn't get enough of Elway's beaming visage. Even the interface seems weirdly lackluster by rare standards. Compare the minimal effort invested into the team selection screen versus pretty much anything else the company had ever developed to this point, and you can't help but be overwhelmed by a profound sense of contractual obligation. You don't hear people wax nostalgic about John Elway's quarterback, because it's been eclipsed in history by a more famous endorsed sports title, John Madden Football. It also came into the world overshadowed by a more appealing take on the sport, which had debuted just a few weeks earlier, Tech Mobile. Oh well, if pro football teaches us anything, it's that you can't win them all. But hey, at least John Elway's wasn't the worst football sim on NES, or even the worst of 1989. We're just a few weeks away from Atlas and LJN inflicting their own take on the sport upon the world, and trying to convince us that a pro ball license makes up for amateur grade game design. As for what Nintendo Power said, well, unusually for a direct arcade port, the magazine actually gave a sizable four-page spread to Marble Madness, containing shockingly well-made maps of most of the game's stages, which I think speaks well of its arcade legacy. Meanwhile, John Elway's quarterback appeared in the Football Roundup in the January-February 1989 issue, sitting alongside the vastly more impressive Tech Mobile, although Nintendo Power was far too much of a marketing tool to directly call out its inferiority. You kind of have to read between the lines. Next time on NES Works, more insidious athletics indoctrination.